Okay, welcome everybody. This is SAT Reading Crash Course Day 1, Part 1. Um, we are going to start with uh, my rules for reading. Um, Irene, if you do me a favor, go ahead and read rule number one of, uh, of my rules for reading, please. Okay. Look up every word you don't know. On this point forward, do it. Yeah. So, uh, so here's the deal. You know, on the SAT reading section, you know, there's, there's, there's two different skill sets that are at play here. One is just kind of general reading comprehension. You just really have to understand academic text. And, um, and if you've got good reading comprehension skills, the biggest factor there is really just knowing academic vocabulary. If you know the words, then you know what you're reading. And if you don't know the words, then you just don't know what you're reading. Academic language is kind of like a foreign language, right? So what I want you to do from this point forward, uh, certainly in all of your prep, certainly uh, your untimed prep, I want you to look up words that you don't know. Okay, and we'll be doing that together. Uh, in the class and when you're doing the homework as well. Every time you see a word you don't know, you need to commit yourself to looking up that word. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, just a simple like Google search, like the word you don't know and then definition. You know, Google definitions are pretty good. They're pretty succinct. Synonyms are great too. Um, but you just have to find out what words mean. And, um, and the good news is Welcome, Ava. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Ava? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Welcome. Uh, we're just going over the rules for uh, reading right now. We just finished rule number one: uh, look up every word you don't know. Um, and uh, anyway, what I was getting at, guys, is that uh, in a very sh relatively short period of time, I'm talking like you know six weeks to uh, to a couple months you'll start to really have a handle on, on academic language. And there, you know, within three or four months of looking up every word you don't know, you're going to understand most of the things that you're reading. It's not going to be an issue. But you have to learn academic language, higher level academic vocabulary. I also recommend doing this in work you're doing on your own, right? Not just for SAT prep, right? But also for any work you're doing in school, any reading you're doing on your own. If you're reading a novel, you see a word you don't know, just look it up. Does that make sense, guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it'll it'll pay big dividends yes. uh, throughout your academic career. Um, uh, you're just always you're just always going to be reading academic texts, and especially if you're going to college, you're going to be reading them constantly. So you just have to know what words mean. So commit to that right now. Make it a habit. You'll be very very glad uh, very glad you did. Okay, uh, Blaze, go ahead and uh, read rule number two for me, please. Um, read for meaning. Don't just rush through text. Slow down, reread when necessary, and ask yourself, what idea is the author trying to communicate here? Okay. If you're anything like me, Blaze, and I'm, I'm guessing Irene and Ava as well, um, there have been times where uh, you're reading a text, and like after you read like a whole page of text, maybe two pages or three pages of text, and you're like, I have no idea what I just read. Have you ever had that experience? Sometimes, yes. Okay, okay. And here's the deal, I get it. I totally get it, especially as, as a former student. Um, you know, sometimes you just read to finish an assignment and you just want to finish it, okay? But those days are in the past now. From now on, uh, if you're reading something, I want you to slow down, don't rush. Probably the biggest reason why you don't understand what you're reading is some complex vocabulary. Look up the words you don't know. Reread the text if necessary. Ask yourself that question, okay, what idea is the author possibly trying to communicate here? Even if you don't fully understand it, Ask yourself that question and try to make some reasonable assumptions about that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the a the, like the era of like blasting through text just to finish an assignment is over. Make a habit of reading for meaning, and if you do that, uh, you know there's there's going to be nothing that surprises you when you take the uh, the SAT um, when you take the SAT reading section. Okay. Any questions about rules one or rule two? No. We good? Ava, do those make sense? I know you kind of joined in the middle of uh, the explanation. That makes sense. Okay, good. So it's all about vocab, and it's all about reading for meaning. Okay, so I want to start with um, a text from that PSAT practice test I linked to you guys earlier. And that is a passage I love so much. 
It is from Jane Austen. Have you guys ever read Jane Austen, out of curiosity? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else, Jane Austen? Uh, I'm going to be brutally honest with you. Jane Austen was one of the uh, the authors I had to read for an assignment in high school, and like I just never got into it. I don't think I ever finished the book. I think I wrote some essays on, on the book. I think it was Pride and Prejudice. I have grown to love Jane Austen. I think she's a brilliant author. I didn't fully appreciate it when I was younger. And I think part of it was just the vocab and the style of, of, of writing. Um, notice, for example, like this passage was written in, it was published in 1815. So this is over 200 years old. So the language is a little bit thick. Um, and here is Blaze. Blaze number two is joining us. Welcome, Blaze. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Hey, uh, just uh, just to let you know, we have two Blazes joining us, Blaze. There's there's a Blaze Williams and Blaze Shahid, so I'll try to refer to you by your last names um, along with the first to avoid confusion. Blaze, real quick, we were just going over the rules for um, rules for reading. They're real simple. Rule number one is look up every word you don't know. We're going to discuss all the vocab in this text. And rule number two is you're going to read for meaning. So slow down, basically, and really digest the text. Don't just blast through it just to get the assignment done. We're going to read uh, to understand. Okay, so I would love to start um, with Ava. Can you see the text on the screen? Ava? Yes, I can. Okay, good. Um, if you will start, we're going to read um, the introduction, please, and then uh, I would love you to read that first paragraph. We're going to read together. We're going to discuss all the vocabulary, and we're just going to talk about approaching academic text, okay? Okay. So go ahead and read that introduction, please. Emma Woodhouse. Oh, start, start, with the, start with the introduction. It's real important. It's, oh, we kind of know who the author is. We get a little context. Yeah. This passage is adopted from Jane Austen. Emma originally published in 1815. 1815. Again, like that's, that's two, over 200 years old. Okay? So we're going to see vocab you've never seen before. The sentence structure is really funky. It's just, it's just, it's just a different kind of text. And you're going to see passages like this on the SAT from the 1800s. This stuff from the 1700s. It gets really complex. So you've got to really have a handle on this kind of, this kind of, um, this kind of text. Go ahead and read that first paragraph, please. Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever, and rich, was a comfortable home, with a comfortable home, and a happy dis disposition. Seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence and had lived nearly 21 years in the world with very little to distress or vex her. Okay, good, really good. Um, let's talk about the vocab here. A couple things, um, Ava. Notice that word handsome, right? Um, yeah, that's a, it's funky, right? Because we're like, you know, these days, you know, handsome, you know, we can call a gentleman handsome, perhaps, or a young lady can call a gentleman handsome. All right, uh, I go in there. Um, but, uh, but in those days, calling a young lady handsome was totally normal. Okay, it just meant pretty. And that was totally cool. Um, clever, rich, comfortable, and happy disposition. Ava, do you know what disposition means? Uh, like a happy uh, start? Uh, happy. Possibly, but it's more specific than that. Does anybody else know what disposition means here in this context? I think it's like your position in life. It's like not. how wealthy your family is. That's a really reasonable oh. guess, based because you see the word position in there. But it's, it's got a very specific meaning. Ava, I'd love you to look that up real quick. Can you look that up? I want you to get in the habit of this. Just okay. do, do a quick Google search. Just Google disposition and then definition. A person's and, inherent. Yeah, it, it, yeah <laughs> inherent. Great, thank you. Yeah, inherent. What was the word again? Yeah, thank you. What was the word again? A disposition. Yeah, yeah, but what was uh, a person's inherent and you said something or other? Qualities of mind and character. Qualities of mind and character. Yeah, good. Is there a synonym there that you see? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, temperament. Yeah. Nature. Yeah. Temperament, nature. Another another good synonym here would be like personality. Right. And uh, go ahead. One of the. Uh, uh, one of the synonyms is kidney. I don't know why. Is, is kidney? It's there. Okay, that's unusual. Okay, yeah. Doesn't all the synonyms apply here, right? So most of the, you, you'll hear the word disposition these days. Most people refer to like the disposition or like the temperament of a maybe a dog or something like that. But it, it just means personality. Okay, so she has a happy personality. 
And look, you know, would you, you know, would you be really thrown off if you thought that here we're talking about her position in life? Not necessarily. Not a big deal. But I want you to know what the word means. And in certain cases, if you don't know what the definition of the word means, could that throw off your understanding of the passage? Absolutely. I think we're seeing some examples of that. So you've got to know what the word means. It's going to help with our understanding a lot. Okay, so she's got a happy personality. Um, she seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence. Ava, do you have any idea what that, what that part of the passage means where it says she seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence? Any thoughts there? Uh, does it mean maybe like she, um, she like culminated those blessings in herself and she... Yeah, what, which, what, which blessings? You're absolutely right. Um, like the blessings of being happy um, and, and generous and stuff like that? Yeah, being happy and all the other stuff they mentioned earlier, right? Handsome and clever and rich, right? In, in, yeah. in, in modern terms, we'd say she's got it going on, right? She's got a lot going for her. Does that make sense? She's uniting some of the best blessings of existence. Does that make sense, guys? Any, question, any questions about that? No? no? Okay, good. Nope. All right, and then the next part here, and she had lived nearly 21 years in the world with very little to distress or vex her. What does vex mean, Ava? Do you know? Uh, it's like a curse, kind of. That's a hex. That's a hex. Oh. Yes, okay. yes, that's a hex. No, no, you're good. Does anybody else know what vex means? Um, it's sort of pester or bother her. Yes, pester, bother, or, or annoy. Right, so she has very little to distress or annoy her. Right, as in, don't vex me, boy. You might hear that phrase. Um, yeah, to bother. Okay? Um, knowing this now, knowing these terms, I want to reread this, Avi. If you read it for me, and I think it's going to make a lot more sense. Go ahead and take it from that, the beginning of that paragraph again, please. Ava? She was the youngest of the two daughters of a most affectionate... Oh, uh, Ava, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I want to actually, I want to reread that paragraph, knowing what those words oh, mean. okay. Yeah. Uh, starting from Emma Woodhouse. Some Emma Woodhouse, uh-huh, yep. Okay. Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever, and rich, was a comfortable home, with a comfortable home and a happy disposition, seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence, and had lived nearly 21 years in the world without, with very little to distress or vex her. Okay. Does that make sense now? Yes. yes. Knowing what those words mean. 100%. Easy. Yes. Easy. We're not guessing at all. You don't have to guess any of the stuff. These words have specific meanings. When you know what the words mean, you know what the author is saying. Okay? Great job there, Ava. Blaise Shahid, are you, uh, can you hear me? Yes. You are up. I would love you to read that next paragraph for us, please. Begin with, she was the youngest okay. daughter. That's line six. Okay. She was the youngest of the two daughters of the most affectionate, indulgent father, and had in consequence, sorry, and had in consequence of her sister and her mistress of yeah. his house. In a very early period. Keep going. Do you want to keep going? Okay. Yeah. Her mother had died too long ago before too long ago for her to have more than a I'm sorry, I'm not a morning person. You're good. You're good. <laughs> oh, her mother had died too long ago for her to have more than an indistinct. Indistinct, yeah. Remembrance of her heresies. And her place had been supplied by an excellent woman as, as governess. <laughs> Who had fallen a little short of a, mo of a mother in it. Okay, good, good. Okay, so let's talk about this vocab. Well, before, before even we do that, did that paragraph make some sense? Or is there a lot of stuff in there you're not sure about? I mean, it's kind of talking about, like, their family line, I guess. Yeah, like, yeah. How they came to be or whatever. Yeah, but I'm guessing there's some stuff in there that the author said that you just don't quite know what idea is being communicated. Is that, yeah, is that fair? Yeah. yeah, right, okay. So let's talk about the vocab here. All right, so she was the youngest of two daughters, the most affectionate, indulgent father. Let's talk about that word indulgent. What does indulgent mean, Blaze? Well, if you indulge in something, then you kind of become a part of it. Maybe. Maybe, but it's more specific than that. Indulgent means something very specific. Does anybody else know what indulgent means? It means sort of giving in to... Oh, well, her father was giving in to her requests. Yes, giving you the requests like all the time. Go ahead, Blaze. I want you to look up the word indulgent and tell me what definition you get. Just tell you do a little Google search, type in indulgent and definition. Tell me what you see. Okay. Having or indicating a tendency to be overly generous or lenient. Great. Overly generous. Overly generous. That's what indulgent means. Okay. Most of the time, if you hear like the word indulge, I think you, I see it on chocolate commercials all the time. 
know what I'm talking about? They're like, indulge yeah. yourself, indulge <laughs> your senses, right? And, yeah. uh, and, and so, yeah, so I can see why you think means like really getting into something. It's very specific. It means be, being overly generous. So it's saying be overly generous with your senses. Anyway, he's an overly generous father. Which means, what's going to happen to her, by the way, if he's overly generous? What's going to happen to Emma? What's the consequence of that? What happens when parents give in to their children all the time? Give them everything they want? What happens to them? I guess spoiled? you can say they become a little spoiled. They get yeah. spoiled, right? They get spoiled. They get spoiled. So I think we can, we can infer that based on the fact that it says she's indulgent. Or that he's indulgent with her, which she is. Okay. Does that make sense? And we know that by knowing what the word indulgent means. And if we don't know what indulgent means, we don't understand that aspect of the relationship. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, we've got to know what these words mean. All right, so he's overly generous, and, uh, and he's still referring to Emma now. And Emma had, in consequence of her sister's marriage, all right, so she got married, Emma had been mistress of his house from a very early period. Okay, now be careful here, Blaze. What does mistress mean in this context? <laughs> Any idea? Oh, my goodness. Um... <laughs> yeah, be careful. <laughs> She's mistress of the house. Anyone know what mistress means here? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else know? That's like the caretaker. Like? Yeah. So look, it, it, look, mistress is just the feminine form of the word master. That's all it is. The feminine form of the word master. So she's the lady of the house, right? Her her sister got married. Older sister, presuming here. Her oldest sister got married. Now she's the oldest woman in the house, and she's in charge of the household. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Very different from the modern kind. Those like the word handsome again. We're like, well, she's handsome. What's going on? She's got a, a nice mustache. What's going on? Right. Like mistress means um, lady of the house. And of course, in the modern context, we're talking about like you know some like some affair or something like that. Not at all here. Okay. She's the lady of the house. Any questions about that? Nope. Nope. Okay. Great. Her mother had died too long ago for her to have more than an indistinct remembrance of her caresses. Okay. Blaze, what does indistinct mean? Indistinct. Like, uh, unknown or not clear. Yeah, perfect. I love the second one. Not unclear. Not clear. Yeah, unknown also. Right? Not distinct. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, so she has a little more than an indistinct remembrance or memory, right? of her caresses. What is a caress, Blaze? Um, could it be, is it belongs in this nope. context or no? Nope. Nope. I've heard the word caress. But I'm yep. Kidding. Look it up. Look it up. Look it up. We got to get in the habit. Look it up, Blaze. Anybody else know what caress is while Blaze is looking that up? No. Just type in, uh, do a little Google search. Uh, caress and definition. That's all you need to do. <laughs> you got a definition? So it's a, yeah, it's, I knew it was a verb. Yeah, it, it, so it's like a, it's, yeah, it's like a motherly, like, a gentle touch. A gentle touch. There is a verb, you can, it can be a verb form. Right, you can caress someone or something, right? But uh, but here it's a noun. It, it's a, a, a gentle touch. Okay. So her mother had died too long ago for her to have more than an indistinct, right, or unclear remembrance of her caresses. Does that make sense now? Know what those words mean? Yes. Okay. Good. All right. And the next part. And her place had been supplied by an excellent woman as governess. Okay. Now here the word supplied means kind of like replaced. Right? Her place, her mother's place, had been supplied or replaced by an excellent woman as governess. Blaze, what is a governess? Um, I would say, like, just like a female governor. <laughs> okay. Yeah, not, not, <laughs> I think even these days, like, female governors are so referred to as, as governors, I believe. Uh, that would be interesting if we, if we began referring to have governesses. I don't know. I don't know how acceptable that would be. But, um, but it's a very, it's a very specific thing, a governess. Uh, you guys have seen Mary Poppins, right? Mary Poppins? Yes. 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 One person. Okay. Okay. Mary Poppins is a governess, like a nanny, right? So, like a, a woman who is in charge of raising children and discipline and maybe some education. That's a governess. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. And, and she's governing, but she's governing over the children. Okay. All right. 
Um, so she replacement supplied by an excellent one as governess who had fallen a little short of a mother in affection. Blaze, what does that last part mean? This governess who had fallen a little short of a mother in affection. So who had fallen a little short of a mother in, in affection? Yeah, That's so what like, does it mean? She hadn't like lost like her mother's love. Uh, what do you mean by that? Shoot. What do you mean? Oh, I think I totally read it back for you. Yeah. Who had fallen a little short of a mother in affection? We're, we're talking about the governess, right? The governess had fallen a little short of a mother in affection. So what does that mean? Dang. Um, <laughs> and if you don't know, that's okay. Any, any yeah, and it's kind of hard to put in different words, I guess. Yeah, any, 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 any ideas from anybody else? What does that mean? She had fallen a little short of a mother in affection. Was, was this governess affectionate or not? Yeah. Hang on. Yeah. Yeah. See, a lot of students read this yeah. the wrong way. They think that she's not very affectionate, this governess. Right? Because they see that she's, you know, she, she'd fallen a little short, they think the little affection. But if she had fallen a little short of a mother in affection, it means she's almost as affectionate as a mother. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. She'd fallen yep. a little short. If she'd fallen greatly short of a mother in affection, she's not very affectionate. But if she'd fallen a little short of a mother in affection, she's very affectionate. She's almost as affectionate as a mother. Right? Which is something to say for someone, you know, a, a nanny, right? Who treats children almost like her own, or if they were her own, her own children. Does that make sense now? Yeah. Okay. All right. Blaze Shaheed, I want you to read that paragraph again. After discussing all the vocab and sort of the sentence structure, I think this is all going to make sense now. Go ahead and read that paragraph, uh, begin with line six. Okay. She was the youngest of the two daughters of a most affectionate and diligent father, and had, in consequence of her sister's marriage, been mistress of his house from a very early period. Her mother had died too long ago for her to have more than an, in an indistinct remembrance of her caresses and her place had been supplied by an excellent woman as gover governess who had fallen a little short of her in Great. Blaze, does that make sense? That yeah, paragraph. Make a lot of Great. Great. And the only difference there, essentially, is that you understand the vocab now. That's basically it. There's a little, like, you know, we have to, like, you know, consider the syntax a little bit, maybe reread a couple things. But if you know the vocab, by and large, you understand exactly the ideas that the author's expressing. This is a vocab game, guys. That's about 80% of your work to prepare for the SAT, especially for the reading section, but also for the writing section. But for the reading section, 80% of it is just knowing your vocab. You've got to know your vocab. And the good news is then, from now on, if you're reading any texts for classes or on your own or anything like that, everything you do, if you look up the words you don't know, everything you're reading becomes SAT prep. Everything. Does that make sense? Yes. You've got to do it. Just commit to looking up words you don't know. And it's gonna, you're going to reap the benefits in the long run. It's going to take some weeks and months, but you will reap those benefits, I promise you. All right, great job there, Blaze. Irene, I would love you to read the next paragraph for me. Begin the line 15, 16 years. Okay. 16 years had Miss Taylor been in Mr. Woodhouse's family, less as a governess than a friend, a very fond of both daughters particularly of Emma. Between them, it was more of the intimacy of sisters. Okay, I'm going to stop you real quick. I'm going to stop you. Does that make sense so far, those first two sentences? Yes. I think. What is, what is, uh, what is uh, the author communicating there in those first two sentences? Can you, can you uh, rephrase those in your own words? Like, they were close, I guess? Who was close? You're absolutely right. Um, Emma and, well, Miss, Mr. Woodhouse's family? <clears throat> well, Emma is in the Woodhouse family, right? It's Emma Woodhouse. But it's Emma and who is very close. You're right. The governess. The governess. Family. The governess. That's Miss Taylor. So the, yeah. They were like sisters? Yeah, they were like sisters. They were like sisters. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, she was very fond of both daughters, but particularly of Emma. She played favorites. Um, okay, good. Um, go ahead and, and pick it up from line 19, even before Miss Taylor. 
Even before his tenure had ceased to hold the nominal office of governess, the mildness of her temper had hardly allowed her to impose any restraint. Okay, I'm going to stop you real quick. Let's talk about the sentence here. So even before Ms. Taylor had ceased to hold the nominal office of governors, what does to cease mean? Irene, do you know what to cease means? To cease. Can you look that up for me? Look that up. To cease. It's a good word. Well, she's looking that up. Does anybody know what it means to cease? It means like to stop to doing something. Yeah, to stop. What did, what did you find, Irene? Mean? To end. To end. To stop. Right. So even after, even before Miss Taylor had ceased to hold or stopped holding the nominal office of governess. Okay. What does nominal mean? Does anybody know? The nominal office of governess. Let's look it up. Let's look it up. Go ahead and look that up, Irene. Existing in name only. Existing in name only. Existing in name. Right comes from the Latin word nomine, right, which means name, right? In nomine patrius et filius et spiriti santi, right? In the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Nomine. So in name. Okay. The nominal office of governance. Now here office means like position. Right? Job of governance. So this means even before Miss Taylor had stopped being called a governess. Okay. The mildness of her temper. What does temper mean here? Irene, do you have any ideas? The mildness of her temper. What does that mean? It's a little tricky. The mildness of her temper. Like a state of mind? Or yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. State of mind or like uh, mood or personality. Like temperament. Again, kind of like disposition. Right? She's got a mild disposition. She has a mild temper. Now, this throws a lot of students off, right? Because they see the word temper, and immediately, what does everybody think when you see the word temper? What do you guys think? When you see the word temper? Could it be like anger almost, or like the, the literal meaning of temper? Well, I mean, mo most people think like they, she gets angry, right? If you hear temper, right? Like, I got a bad temper. You know what I'm saying? Most people think that. But what makes, wh why we associate temper with anger is because that's a bad temper. As opposed to like a mild temper, a mild temperament. Does that make sense? <laughs> over over the years, the word is the the, word, the meaning of the word has changed. Just like like mistress, for example, right? Or or uh, or, or handsome. For that matter. You know, words they do change. You just have to be if you're reading a passage from the eighteen hundreds. You just have to be familiar with with definitions from this time period. And uh, yeah, that's the only way. That's the only way to do it. So um, okay. So the mildness of her temper, the mildness of her personality, had hardly allowed her to impose any restraint. What does that mean, to impose any restraint, Irene? To, like, give discipline? Yes, exactly. Exactly, to impose, to force any restraint, holding her back in any way, basically, any discipline. Okay? I want you to reread that sentence, beginning with line 19, even before Miss Taylor. I want you to reread that now, knowing what we know now. Reread that. I think it's going to make sense. Even before Miss Taylor had ceased to hold the nominal office of governess. Keep going. The mildness. Mildness. Yeah, go ahead and finish that. Finish that sentence. The mildness of her temper had hardly allowed her to impose any restraint. Okay, does that make sense now? Yes. Any questions about that, guys? Got to know that vocab. All right, keep reading, please, Irene. And the shadow of authority began now, long past away. They had been living together as friend and friend, very mutually attached. And Emma, doing just what she liked, highly esteemed Miss Taylor's judgment, but directly chief, but, but directed chiefly by her. Okay, good, good. Okay, what does that mean there? The, and the shadow of authority being now long passed away. What does that mean there, Irene? Any ideas? What could the author be saying? Maybe her background. She had authority in her background. In, in, she had authority. Yeah, you're right. She had authority in the past. In the past, yeah. right? Her authority is past, right? So 
uh, the, so Shadow of Authority not long being passed away, they've been living together as friend and friend very mutually attached. What does that mean? I think you can figure that out. They've gotten, like, they're close? Yeah, they're just close now, right? They're just friends now. Right? She's not, like, a governess to her anymore. Right? They're just friends. And Emma doing just what she liked, highly esteeming Miss Taylor's judgment. What does that mean to esteem, I mean? To build up? Not to build up. Does anyone else know what esteem means here in this context? Sort of. Make, make her look yes. Good. Somebody said respect. Was that you, Irene? Or Ava, maybe? Yeah, uh, esteem means to respect. She respected Miss Taylor's judgment, but it says, but directed chiefly by her own. Irene, what does that mean? Directed chiefly by her own. By her own what? Her own respect? Not her own respect. By her own what? Does anybody else know? Her own judgment. Her own judgment. So she respects Miss Taylor's judgment, right? She respects what she thinks, but she does what she wants. She's directed chiefly by her own judgment. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? No. Woo! This is some thick language. This is some thick language. But you know what the words mean. By and large, you're going to be good. Let's go to um, Blaze Williams. Blaze, take it from uh, the top, I guess we're at line 28, the real evils. Go ahead and read that. Line yeah. Hang on. Uh, line. Okay. The real evils, the real indeed. evils, uh, the real evils indeed of Emma's situation were the power of having rather too much her own way, and the disposition to think little too well of herself, or a little too well of herself. Yes. Keep going. These were the, these were the disadvantages that threatened Alloy yeah. to her many enjoyments. Okay, I'm gonna stop you real quick. Okay, so the real evils of Emma's situation. What does that mean? The real evils indeed of Emma's situation. What is that referring to? The only, like, faults or the only problems. The only problems, yeah. And this is where, like, again, evil today, we think, like, ooh, like, Satan or something like that, right? I mean, like, that's not quite what I mean. The only problems, right? The first situation, with the power of having too much her own way and a disposition to think a little too well of herself. Does that make sense, knowing what disposition means now? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Good. Now, the next part's tricky. These were the disadvantages which threatened alloy to her many enjoyments. And here this is a tr tr funky use of the word alloy, or, or alloy. Um, we see that word. Does anybody know what an alloy is in terms of, like, science or min um, min mineralogy? It's a metal made, yeah. it's a metal made by combining two elements. Yes. It's like, metal. Exactly, right? So the, the classic example of an alloy is bronze, right? Because mm -hmm. bronze is a combination of, I believe, tin and copper. You mix those together, you get it. Bronze, which is an alloy, which has, like, the benefits of both metals. It's strong, but also somewhat flexible. Um, that's an alloy. So, so um, we're talking about these disadvantages which threatened alloy to her many enjoyments. We're talking about they threatened to combine with the many things she has going on. Does that make sense? Yeah, now it does. It's a really funky use of that word. I've never seen it before, except in this passage. Now, I'll be honest, I'm not sure if it's like, it's like a noun here, I guess, but it's just really, yeah, it's, it's a really funky syntax. But knowing what the word alloy means as a combination here, it's going to make sense of that. Okay, go ahead and finish off that paragraph, please. The danger. Um, sorry, wait, the danger, however, was at present so unperceived that they did not by any means rank as misfortunes for her. And what does that mean? Um, saying that the problem wasn't as big a problem, uh, well, it wasn't a very troubling problem at the moment. For Emma. Yeah. Right, for Emma. They, these don't rank as misfortunes. Or what, what problems are, is the author referring to here? Problems mentioned earlier. What tendency to think of herself. I think to praise herself. Uh -huh. And, yeah, her disposition. Yeah, at the very top right here, getting her own way too much and thinking too well of herself. Right, Those are the problems. Yeah. But she doesn't see them as problems. Right? As, as most people that think too well of themselves probably don't. Okay, great job there, Blaze. Um, Ava. Let's uh, go and read that next paragraph. I think we're going we're gonna to be able to pick up the pace a little bit. Um, from line 35. Sorrow came. Ava Sorrow shaky. came. Gentle sorrow, but not at all in the shape of any disagreeable consciousness. What, is, what does disagreeable mean? 
Um, it's like, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, Look it up! Look it up! Okay. Look it up. You know, it's been it's been my experience that if students don't you know, can't provide a definition, you, I mean, you kind of have a general sense maybe, but you don't know exactly what it means. You know, and that's okay. We're gonna find out what these words mean. Not pleasant or enjoyable. Perfect. Unpleasant. Yeah. Unpleasant. Great. Okay. Um, okay. Take it from uh, yeah, line thirty-seven, Miss Taylor. Miss Taylor married. It was Miss Taylor's loss first brought grief. It was on the wedding day of this beloved friend sat in mournful thought of, of any continuance. Okay, what does that mean? It was on the wedding day of this beloved friend that Emma first sat in mournful thought of any continuance. What does that mean? It, is it referencing like the continuation of the friendship? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Exactly, right? She's thought first sat in mournful thought of any continuance or the, or the fact that their friendship wasn't going to continue. Because she was going to get married. All right, keep going, please. The wedding over. Okay, the wedding over and the bride people gone. Her father and herself were left to dine together with no prospect of a third to cheer a long evening. Her father composed himself to sleep after dinner, as usually usual. Oh, I lost my soul. You're good. Uh, and she had then only to sit and think of what she had lost. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. What about that part where it says the, the wedding over and the bride people gone, her father and herself were left to die together with no prospect of a third to cheer a long evening? What does that mean? Um, it meant like they felt lonely because Miss Taylor wasn't there to, to, you know, like be there and hang out with them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then it says her, her father composed himself to sleep after dinner. What does that mean exactly? He was getting ready for bed. That's all. Just getting ready for bed. That's it. Okay. Good. Good. Any questions about that, guys? No. Interesting use of the word composed, right? Very interesting. Very interesting. She needs to prepare, right? Compose himself to sleep after dinner. Okay. Um, great job there, Ava. Uh, Blaze, Shahid, take from line 47, the event. All right. The event had every promise of happiness for her friend. Mr. Weston was a man of unexceptionable character, easy fortune, suitable age, and pleasant man. Okay, let's stop. Let's stop. Let's talk about a couple things here. First, that word, unexceptionable. I'll bet you can figure out what that word means. Unexceptional. If you say something is exceptional, then it's, then it's good, so it must be. Well, that's, ex that's exceptional. That's exceptional, right? If it's exceptional, it means it is the exception. It's, it's, it's extraordinary, right? If it's, but it's not exceptional. Un it's not unexceptional. It's unexceptionable. Okay. Mm. Can we figure out what that might mean? He's a man of unexceptionable character. Is it good or bad, by the way? It's probably good. Like, I'm just looking at the context of all the other stuff. He's got an easy force and suitable age. We'll talk about it. Well, that means just a minute. Um, it's good, right? So this goes back to, like, an old meaning of the word exception. Have you ever heard someone say, like, and it's generally, like, in an old movie or something like that, someone's like, I take exception to your behavior. Have you heard that before? Yes, I've heard that. Okay. I take exception to this. Okay. So if, if he has an unexceptionable character, you are unable to take exception to his character. He's, he's a good guy through and through. Does that make sense? Okay. Really funky. Like, I've never seen that word outside of this passage. But if you break it down, you can come up with a reasonable guess or just look up the definition, which is what I'd recommend. Okay. Uh, easy fortune. What does that mean, Blaze? Easy fortune. Easy fortune, like, Basically, shoot, I guess I've never really heard that. I've never used fortune used. To yeah, that. yeah. Does, does anybody, anybody have any ideas? He's got easy, he's, he's a man of easy fortune. I like this term. I would like to be a man of easy fortune. He, like, he earned his fortune just from like getting it passed down so he didn't have to work for it? Yeah, and that's exactly, in practical terms, what it means, right? Especially in those days, we're talking like British aristocracy, right? Um, if you're an aristocrat, you owned land, and you got money, income based on, you know, uh, you know, people renting properties from you or like farm farmers, you know, renting land from you. You had money coming in regularly, right? They didn't have, necessarily have to work for it. You might manage the property, right? But you also might hire somebody to manage it for you. Basically, you're making money without working, right? Man of easy fortune. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, great. Suitable age. 
What does that mean, Blaze? Mr. Weston is a man of suitable age. Any thoughts? He's a man of like, suitable age. I mean, middle-aged, I guess. I mean, like, this is kind of, it's probably a stretch, but... <laughs> no, no, I think it's reasonable, right? Suitable, I mean, like, it's... Look, you know, uh, he's not too old, not too young for Miss Taylor. I don't know how old Miss Taylor is exactly, I haven't read the book. Um, but, uh, you know, let's say, you know, Miss Taylor may be, like, 25 or something like that, and he's 35 or 40. Something like that would be sort of suitable in those days, pretty standard. Does that make sense? He's not an old man, and he's not too young. Yeah, I see. Okay. All right. And pleasant manners, that's easy. Okay. Read that next part, um, begin line 50, and there was some satisfaction. And there was some satisfaction in considering with what self-denying generous interests she always had. She had always wished and promoted the match. Okay. Oh. There was some satisfaction to do with what self-denying generous friendship she had always wished and promoted the match. What does that mean there, Blaze? Any thoughts? Um, it's almost like... It's almost like a... There's some satisfaction in considering with what self-denying generous friendship she'd always wished and promoted the match. Is it like, even though she didn't want it, um, the friendship between uh, Miss Taylor and Mr. Weston was almost, or pretty much just as good of a match as uh, Emma's and Miss Taylor's? Um, I, didn't quite, I didn't quite follow that. It, it's it's kind of specific here. It's a, it's a real specific idea, which is basically saying she took satisfaction. Oh, okay, look. Is Emma going to benefit from the fact that her friend is getting married? Is she going to benefit from that? Yes or no? Um, it would technically be yes. Why do you say yes? Well, I mean, oh, I guess it wouldn't because they're not like directly related, but... I mean, her friend is, is her friend is, is going to be moving away from the house, right? After the wedding night, she's gone. She's going to be married. She's going to be occupied with a, a husband and a family. Their friendship is, as it has been at least, is going to be gone. Yeah. Right? So she's not really benefiting much, right? She's not benefiting much. But what's interesting here is the author says, but there was some satisfaction in considering with what self-denying, generous friendship she'd always wish and promote the match. So even though she's doing something sort of selfless, Right? She's still taking some satisfaction and thinking like, I am being such a good person. I am being so self-denying. Right? She took satisfaction in that. Does that make sense? Or no? Yes, that makes sense. So like, even in a selfless act, she's still being kind of selfish. Weirdly. There's a Seinfeld episode. Is you guys familiar with Seinfeld at all? That may be... Has anybody ever watched Seinfeld? Yes, you guys watch? Have you seen it? That may be no. like... Just yeah, you guys, so you guys were probably born after Seinfeld's off the air. It's an old show, and uh, the the main character in the show, Jerry Seinfeld, there's an episode where he's going around and he's doing these like quote unquote selfless acts, all the like holding doors open for people and like helping an old lady cross the street and all this stuff. But the whole time he's thinking like, I am such a good person, right? And of course, like bad things happen as a result. But he's so focused on being self satisfied with this selfless acts and he doesn't realize that he's like creating all these problems anyway there's, it makes me think of that a little bit um, Blaze go ahead and take it from the want of Miss Taylor okay. which place uh, so that's line 54 oh no actually I skipped ahead I apologize uh, but it was a, uh, so it's line 50 53 but it was a black morning's work okay but it was a black morning's work for her the want of Miss Taylor would be felt every hour of every day. Okay, stop. What does that mean? She really misses Miss Taylor. She really misses Miss Taylor. That's it. That's it. Good. Okay, keep going, please. Um, she recalled her past kindness, the kindness, the affection of 16 years, how she had taught, how she had played with her from five years old, how, he should, how she had devoted her, all her powers to attach and amuse her help her in health, and how nursed her through the various illnesses of childhood. A large debt of gratitude was owing here, 
but the intercourse of the last seven years, the equal footing and the perfect unreserve which had soon followed Isabella's marriage and their being left to each other was yet a dearer, tender, rec a tender a recollection. Okay, okay, we gotta stop. What in the heck is going on here? What is, what is, what is what's, what's the author communicating here? She's talking about how much Miss Taylor cared for Emma. Yeah? When? All throughout her life. All throughout her life. All throughout her life. Okay, good. Well, from five years old. Yes, yeah, you're right. Good Good point. Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, so, 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 and there was a large debt of gratitude. Large debt of gratitude was owing here. So she's very grateful for it. Okay? Now, the next part's tricky, but the intercourse of the last seven years. Now, here, the word intercourse here again, boy, it has that taken a different turn uh, in the past centuries. But here, in this context, intercourse just means interaction. Interaction. Does that make sense? We're not going to talk about the current definition. But here, interaction, uh, the relationship between them in the last seven years, the equal footing and perfect unreserve, which had soon followed Isabella's marriage on their being left to each other, was yet a dearer, tenderer recollection. Blaze, what in the heck does that mean? Essentially saying that um, because of that kindness and how they were such good friends, even after she was technically a governess, or even after she was just, it wasn't called the governess, it still left some good memories instead of just completely missing her. Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's more than that. It's more specific than that, too. So they're talking about the memory she has of when she was younger, right up here, like line 55 through 60, right? Her past kindnesses, when she was taken care of when, when she was a child. And then it, here, it, it, it makes a break here, but the intercourse of the last seven years, the equal footing and perfect unreserved which had soon followed Isabel's marriage on the being left to each other, was yet a dear, tender recollection. What she said is their friendship in the past seven years was even dearer and even tenderer than her memories of her being taken care of as a child. Uh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, now it does. It's a very specific idea being communicated there. It's tricky. It's tricky. There's a long sentences right there. But, uh, but that's the idea being communicated. Guys, any questions about that? Are we good? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Great. Let's keep going from It Had Been a Friend. Line 65. From It Had Been a Friend and Companion, such as few possessed, intelligent, well-informed, useful, gentle, knowing all the ways of the family, interested in all its concerns, and peculiar, peculiar, peculiarly, uh, peculiar, peculiarly interested in herself in every pleasure, every scheme of hers one to whom she could speak every thought as it arose, and who had such an affection for her as could never find fault. Okay. Whoa, let's go. Okay. Uh, what is going on there? Can you kind of summarize the main ideas there? Um, Emma is thinking about all of Miss Taylor's good qualities. Yep. Yep. And specifically what? Um, how she could, how she was a close confidant. Okay, good. She could share everything with her. I guess that's really, yeah, that's really it. That's the main idea there. One to whom she could speak every thought as it arose, and who had such an affection for her as could never find fault. So she's just very affectionate, in short. Okay. Guys, any questions about that paragraph? Or the rest of that paragraph? No. No? We're good? Okay, great. Um, and that was Blaze Williams. I apologize. I don't know if I skipped it. I think it's Ava's turn. Is that right? Ava, should you? Go ahead and take it, Ava, from uh, How Is She to Bear the Change? Line 73. Okay. How was she to bear the change? It was true that her friend was going only half a mile from them, but Emma was aware that growth must be the difference between a Mrs. Mrs. Weston only half a mile from them. Excuse <laughs> me. Um, and a Miss Tyler in their house. Okay, stop, stop. <laughs> Okay, what is being communicated there? What's the author saying? Um, you have to deal with the change between uh, Miss Tyler being in her house and and her becoming Mrs. Weston and living half a mile away from her. Yes, yes. Which is a big difference. A big difference in their relationship. But it's only half a mile distance. But it's a major difference in their relationship. Yeah. Make sense? Okay, great. Let's keep going from uh, 77 and with all her advantages. And with all her advantages, uh, natural and domestic, 
She was now in great danger of suffering from intellectual solitude. Ooh, what does that mean? She dearly what does that mean? She, didn't, she was now in danger of just closing herself away from the world. Yeah, yeah, or like, so the, like her world had sort of moved away from her. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. And she, you know, with all her advantages, we're talking about like her social advantages, right? I mean, she's, and she's bright, she's talented and clever and all these things. But now she's in great danger of suffering from intellectual solitude or loneliness. Right? Keep going, please, from line 80. She dearly loved her father, but he was no companion for her. He could not meet her in conversation rational only. Okay, great. What does that mean? He could not meet her in conversation rational only? Uh, like, either, like, he just wasn't, uh, he didn't... Uh, I guess enjoy the same conversations. Yeah. Maybe he was. Yeah, or, or like not capable of it. Yeah. Right? He couldn't meet in conversation with rationalists. They couldn't discuss like, you know, intellectual things, but like also, you know, just like being clever and witty. Like she just, she's just not on her level socially. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, great. Great. All right, Blaze Shahid, you're up that last paragraph. Alrighty. The evil of the actual disparity in their ages, and Mr. Woodhouse had not married early. Okay, I'm going to stop you real quick. Once again, we see this term, this word evil, right? We're not talking about, like, you know, good versus evil. We're talking about a problem, right? The problem of the actual disparity in their ages. What does disparity mean here? Like, the difference. Difference, exactly. Exactly. Good. So the problem of the actual difference in their ages, and Mr. Woodhouse had not married early, which means what? Um, I guess that would mean that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Guys, what does that mean? It's real simple. Mr. Wood has said that married early, which means what? So he, he's kind of old when he married. He's an old guy. Yeah. yeah, he was old when he married and had children, and now he's got a grown daughter, so he's, he's even older now. You know, he might have married at 50 or something like that, which happened in those days. Okay. Um, uh, okay. And the, that difference was much increased by his constitution and habits. Blaze, any, what is, what is, any ideas what that means here? I guess we got to talk about that word constitution. This is interesting, right? Yeah. Founding, or like, you know. I totally get why you're thinking founding. I totally get it, right? You're thinking in terms of like American government. Yeah. Right? Totally think. And here, and this is interesting, I, I love words and I love where words come from. Constitution just means makeup. Makeup. Um, as in, like, what something it's constituted of, right? And that's why our Constitution is called the Constitution, because it tells us what is the makeup of American government, right? You got three branches you got executive branch, legislative branch, judicial branch, right? It's the makeup of American government. That's why we call it a Constitution. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, another, uh, yeah. Constitution here can also, like, describe as its health. Basically, there was a time um, back in the day where, you, if you went for a walk, you could call it a constitutional. You're going out for a constitutional, a healthy walk. <laughs> so, anyway, we need to bring that back. Can you guys, yeah. can you guys do me a favor, and I, I'm going to, I'm going to start. You guys do, do, do work on your end and bring that term back. I'm going for a constitutional. Good day to you. All right. Anyway, um, okay. Take it now from uh, line 85 for having, for having been. For having been a valedictorian? No, no, no. Valetudinarian is the word. Right? And then and then they give us a definition here. Every once in a while they'll do that if it's a really obscure word. Go read that definition quickly, please. Is it the one at the bottom, right? Yep, yep. A person in weak health who is overly concerned with his or her ailments. Yeah, a person in weak yep. health who is overly concerned with his or her ailments. Um... Yeah, I like to make a joke that I was the valetudinarian of my graduating class in college. Uh, it's not very funny, but I, I like to make that joke, but I can't resist it. Anyway, because it sounds like valedictorian. Right here, we're talking about a person who's overly concerned with their health. All right, so he'd been a valetudinarian all his life. I think some, someone's uh, pressing some buttons, I think. Uh, and it's kept coming up on the speakers quite a bit. Can you guys... If, if you can go ahead and press buttons if you need to. But if you'll mute it, that would be, that would be uh, great, just because I don't want that to come up on the, uh, on the recording. Thank you. Um, okay, and then uh, so about to else's life. Uh, go just finish off that uh, from line eighty-six, please, please. Okay, so 
been a valedictorian of his, all his life without activity of mind or body. He was much older. He was a much older man in ways than in years, and though everywhere beloved, everywhere beloved for the friendliness of his heart and his am, amiable temper, his talents could not have recommended him at any time. Yeah, yeah. I want to go back to the part. So, so, so. Okay, so even though were, he was really old, <laughs> that difference was much increased by his constitution and habits. Okay, so he'd been this sickly guy, that activity of body, body or, uh, mind or body, and so he was a much older man in ways than in years. What does that mean, Blaze? He was a much older man in ways than in years. So I guess, like, his experiences, um, I don't know, kind of developed more in ways than, like, his time living. What does that, yeah, what does that mean, like, in just, like, normal terms? He's, I guess, has insight on other things. I mean, you can, you can say, I mean, we associate age with wisdom, I, I hope. Uh, I like to think that. Um, but that's not, what the, that's not the idea the author's communicating here. It's real specific. It's real specific. He's a much older man in ways than in years. Could it mean, like, um, just, like, in the way he was, like, raised almost and not necessarily, like, the age that made him into a man? Or like his, like I guess, physical challenges or whatever. What does it mean? He's a much old man in ways. Just in in way, like what does that mean? He's a, he's old in ways. He's old in ways. Ways is referring to things he does, right? The things he does. He's a much older man in ways, in what he does than in years. So look, he's already old, but because of his bad health and lack of activity in body or mind. He's even, he acts even older than he is. So maybe he's like 65 or 70, but he acts like an 85-year-old man. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. He's a much older man in ways than in years. Guys, does that make sense? Everybody else? Yes. Yeah. So he's old, but he's, he acts even older. That's the idea of being communicated. Okay. And then, and though everywhere beloved for the friendliness of his heart and his amiable temper. Blaze, you know what amiable means? Amiable. Um, that means like lovable. Yeah, perfect, perfect, lovable, right? From the from the Latin amo or amare, right? It's to love. Uh, Spanish amigo, right? Friendly, but amiable, absolutely. Lovable temper, lovable personality, and this says his talents could not have recommended him at any time. That means couldn't have recommended him like socially, right? He wasn't he wasn't he wasn't particularly socially gifted. Even though he's a nice guy. All right, which is why Emma's in fear of being suffering from intellectual solitude. Okay, that's that. Questions about that passage? Uh, nope. No. Do you see how we stopped and looked up the vocab and chewed on that language quite a bit? Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah? That's how you got to approach these texts, guys. Start with the vocab, and then kind of read and reread, and kind of chew and consider what's what's possible, what's what what the author is is possibly trying to communicate there. That's uh, that's rules one and two of my rules for reading. Okay, now the good news is not all passages are this difficult. Uh, not all passages are from the 1800s. Most aren't. Most are. Most of the passages you're going to be reading here in the SAT are much more recent, really within the past 10 or 15 years. Uh, there's a lot of like scientific journal articles and that sort of thing. Um, so, so I think some of the, the complications of this passage we're not going to see in, in most of the passages that we're reading, but you still see these. And you got to have a handle on this kind of text. Okay. All right, let's um, do this. Let's take us a little uh, three to five minute break and um, run to the restroom, get some coffee. I'm, I'm here at Starbucks right now, so I, I, I can uh, definitely get a refill here. And uh, we'll come back, and then we're going to talk about answering these questions of how to approach questions in the SAT. Okay, guys? All right. Thank you so much. I will see you guys after a little break. All right. All right. Bye.